Hi, everyone, and welcome to what I believe is the BSME's first ever seminar, Investigative Journalism. Um, we have a fantastic panel today, and I'm glad to say it's my first choice from pretty much everyone. So uh, it's great to have this panel here. So um, we'll start off with Rachel. Rachel Aldroyd is the um, former managing editor of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is pretty much the gold standard of investigative journalism. Um, we have uh, Harry Rose, who's the editor of Witch, and uh, you don't need any introduction to Witch. You know, one of our uh, most beloved consumer magazines um, that's had a, a amazing history of investigative journalism and we've also got Peter Apt um, who is the deputy editor of Inside Housing who um, as a B2B editor myself uh, we've been in awe of what Inside Housing have done especially around Grenfell and Cladding uh, so it's great to have everyone on board. So we're here today to discuss investigative journalism um, and I know that we've got quite a decent uh, decent number uh, tuned in today so hopefully hopefully you'll get to learn something. Um, we are recording this um, so if you do miss anything uh, it will be uh, it, you will be able to find it um, find it later um, and uh, we'll let's crack on then. So um, we're going to start by uh, having our, our esteemed panel talk us through some of their best investigations. Um, Rachel I think we'll start with you if that's okay. So I thought I would mention two of the investigations that the Bureau did recently. And I'm a, an editor. I was running the Bureau. So um, I'm very top level. I'm not down in the weeds of the story. So the actual tricks and um, difficulties and the, the, all the, the detail you're not going to get from me. But I'll give you a top level view of the two stories. Um, I also have picked the two stories because I think it's quite interesting to think about what is investigative journalism and um, because for me I think there's two types of journalism there's the reporting of everyday events trying to record what's going on and then there's everything else and everything else is um, sometimes called off diary journalism deep dive um, even explainers or very hardcore traditional um, full-on year-long reporting on on something or a big leak. And all of that, I think, can be classed into this um, investigative journalism bag. And I think, really, if we were starting to think about investigative journalism, it's just holding people to account, asking interesting questions. Um, and one of the areas I think that we can ask way more questions of is science and medicine, because there definitely isn't enough questioning in these two areas, partly because we don't have the skill sets, but also because these are our big religions and our big sort of areas that we don't want to question. So the, the two investigations I thought I'd mention briefly, one is a medical investigation and the other is um, a food environment investigation. And the medical investigation was a big um, deep dive look at COVAX, which our brilliant um, health reporter Rosa Furno did. And there was nothing technical about this. There was no follow the money. There was no reading accounts. There was no big leaps or big data. What she did was she decided to find out what was going on in COVAX, how people felt about COVAX, and whether it was doing the job that they set out to do. So she literally spent six months calling people. And that was the skill set. And that is a skill set in itself because she spoke to so many people. She had to build a picture. She had to build immense patience immense resilience and she had to follow threads and follow things she was told over a long period of time and then keep keep questioning um, and seeing if what she had been told six months ago was still relevant when we came to publication six months later um, and that piece of work has won lots of awards it raised lots of really important questions and over a big massive important institution during the pan pandemic that was supposed to be delivering vaccinations to the developing world um, and there was you know this model is a model that the health world wants to continue with so it's really important that we learn lessons and it's really important we ask questions so that is a piece of work that I was immensely proud of well immensely proud that she did and she put the hours and weeks and days into and then another investigation I want to mention, because it's on the complete other spectrum of the scale, it's a um, environment, food environment investigation, which um, our amazing environment chief reporter, Andrew Wosley did. He is an absolute expert in tracking supply chains. And he has looked at, and this wasn't just him, it was a big team, um, of reporters across The Guardian, at Unearthed, in Greenpeace, and reporters in our team. 
And they did two pieces of work, really important pieces of work, where they looked at areas in the Amazon rainforest that um, where there had been fires, where the ground had been completely, the rainforest had been completely burnt down. Um, and one investigation was looking at cattle that was bred on this land and the other looking at soy that was bred on this land. And then they tracked those products right through the supply chain, right through the biggest producers in Brazil, followed shipping data, tracked it when it came to the UK, took it all the way to Cargill, took it to the farm in um, Herefordshire to prove that that actually ended up in Tesco and Sainsbury's and the co-op. Um, and so that they could actually then have a conversation with these big uh, cons consumer um, suppliers, our big supermarkets, to say that, you know, we, the people that are buying stuff from the supermarkets, we really need to care about who, about the Amazon, and we really need to know about our food stuff. So, and that involved a huge amount of technical skill and a huge amount of experience, and is at the other extreme end, but again, a really important um, piece of investigative journalism that I was really proud that we did. Rachel, I mean, they, they sound absolutely fascinating. I've got plenty of questions to ask about that, but if we could uh, just move on to Harry and then Peter, and then, uh, and then we'll come back to that. Uh, Harry, do you want to talk us through a couple of yours? Yeah, so um, I kind of wanted to choose examples that, that really exemplified what which is about. Um, you know, and so I started thinking about the, the kind of the history and the traditions of which as a, as a sort of testing organisation, but a, a, a kind of campaigning and, a, and an investigative research organisation as well. And um, I started thinking about things like seatbelts, which we, we campaigned for right back in the um, early 60s, when basically cars didn't come with seatbelts as standards and you could buy these um, very dodgy ones that you basically just installed yourself in your car and, and, and those were useless. And, you know, we did, we did all the things that we do now. We, we tested the seatbelts, we campaigned for them to be compulsory in cars. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we scrutinized the safety records of, uh, of different cars and, you know, that kind of deep um, analysis and research. Um, you know, and that, so that, those are our traditions. So I think, you know, in terms of, of, of what sprung to mind from recent years that kind of, carries those those principles on that that way of doing things on um i mean in recent years it's things like our work um exposing some of the, the consumer harm um enabled by the tech giants you know whether that's fake reviews um or or advertising that's carried on platforms um, such as facebook and google um where there's just not enough scrutiny um placed on on those advertisers so one thing we did a couple of years ago was we uh, we created a fake company with a fake website and a fake product, which was a bottled water brand. But we we basically set this water brand up to to make all these kind of spurious health claims, um, and and basically you know did the absolute bare minimum required to make it feasible that we were a real company. But basically any kind of scrutiny that we were placed under by the platforms would have exposed that we were you know this was bollocks. Um, and, but of course, not, you know, none of it happened, and the adverts, um, you know, appeared. And you know, it's, it's similar with with things like fake reviews, where we've, um, you know, we've set up fake companies um, and then gone to these shady review brokers that that exist as as kind of middlemen between um, fraudsters and scammers and uh, and and platforms that um, you know that that ultimately host reviews that are, are fraudulent relating to, to their products. Um, and it's so easy, uh, but it's that it's that kind of threshold of proof that we want to um, we want to achieve. You know, we have a hypothesis. There are fake reviews on uh, on a platform like Amazon or, or on Facebook or on Google, um, but we know that it's so much more powerful if we can if we can prove that in a substantial way um, beyond um, beyond kind of re reporting and speculation, but to really build that body of evidence as a kind of campaigning organisation. So. Um, yeah, I think in those areas we've done we've done some great work in recent years. Uh, the other the other one I it always sticks in my mind is actually before my time. Um, but we have a we have a brilliant um, food researcher uh, called uh, Shafali Loth who um, has real expertise and, and and a background in nutrition and, and academia uh, at the NHS. And you know it's typical of the sorts of people we have it, which we're lucky enough to employ people with a real range of experiences and backgrounds. Um, one of her most high-profile high investigations was um, was into food fraud, 
um, and it involved basically buying a load of lamb takeaways um, and sending them off to a lab and doing DNA tests on the meat. Um, and we basically found that 40% of the lamb um, contained other meats in addition to lamb. Um, some of them contain no lamb at all. Um, so completely different. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm lucky enough to edit a magazine that's incredibly vast in what it covers. Um, so food fraud, tech giants, um, seat belts in the 60s, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all part of our, um, of our thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a joy to be a part of as an editor. Fascinating. I love the idea of starting a fake company. That just sounds incredible. Uh, also, I remember um, judging one of your awards, actually, w- one of your award entries on uh, investigation into hotel cleanliness uh, during the COVID protocols. If I remember rightly, didn't you book two hotel rooms, uh, one after the other, to make sure that the hotels had actually cleaned them? Is that right? Uh, I should say I'm not uh, I'm not the editor of which travel, which is a sister title, which, which okay. would have been responsible for that one. They do they do absolutely brilliant investigations. Uh, I'm sure your your recollection of it is uh, is right. Um, you know, and another point with a lot of these is we 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 do investigations. Um, you know, if if we uncover a load of of dodgy stuff, you know, we'll do it again a couple of years later. Um, to see whether it's still happening, you know, and it, because we're campaigners as well, we, we, we actually want to change these things. And so it's, you know, you can't expose it enough time sometimes. And so I know, you know, our travel team are absolutely ruthless in, uh, in prosecuting the, um, the hotel chains or, you know, and other types of businesses, um, you know, and, and, and if the, you know, if the same, the same airline or the same hotel chain as often happens, um, you know, comes, comes bottom of our table, um, you know, it's all the more reason to test them out again in the future. But yeah, the, the work they've done through the pandemic has been absolutely remarkable um, and, and something we're all proud of. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, Peter, do you want to talk us through uh, a couple of your proudest investigations? Sure. Um, so I, I'm the deputy editor at Inside Housing magazine, um, which is a, a trade publication for the uh, social housing sector. Um A lot of our work in the last five years has focused on the aftermath of the Grenfell Tower fire and um, some of the work we've done has been into into that aftermath and some of it's been into sort of looking into why the fire happened, sort of doing um, some of of that research, which is also kind of ended up coming up on the public inquiry. Uh, A couple that I I, I would uh, pick out from various sources is it's quite difficult <laughs> to talk about them without kind of giving away uh, sources, but, you know, to do, do the best I can. Um, one was uh, a, a cache of documents that we got from, um, and I, I mentioned this because it's a bit weird. It's not something I've ever done before. It sort of became a bit more of a history project than journalism, really, but it was a cache of documents from the 1990s, um, which related to a, a cladding tower block fire, um, in the 90s, which was kind of well known, it was known that it had happened, um, but the backstory wasn't. Um, and we'd actually, uh, there'd been a report in Private Eye at the time written by Paul Foote, who was quite a famous investigative journalist um, of his era, um, who suggested that there was kind of more than meets the eye to, the, to this fire, but didn't really um, spell it out in any more detail than that. Um, and we managed to get hold of these documents. I, I, I got them from a contact who, he, it's, this is actually twice in my career this has happened to me where he didn't actually want to relinquish the documents. Um, so I had to kind of go and visit him at his house and sort of sit in his back garden um, and kind of scribble things down um, while uh, the kind of family life went on around us. Uh, and then we, we were able to use those. It's a very funny thing. You've got... Um, documents from such a long time ago it's quite difficult to verify and it's quite difficult to piece together the picture that you're seeing but we were able to um reveal that that block was actually a government sponsored project to test the efficiency of cladding and after it went up in flames um there was a handwritten memo sort of tucked into one of these files which said um we've received instructions from the government press office to play down the issue of fire um, and that was a revelation that was kind of backed up in um, further documents where sort of civil servants were discussing the um, 
implications for other cladding schemes that they wanted to see go ahead or they provided funding to if people became worried that there was a, there was a fire risk associated with that method of building. Um, and it, it, we were able, I, I then managed to get some other interviews sort of following through old select committee reports and phoning people and trying to find out who was still alive basically um, and could, could have had reliable memories of this stuff or was able to kind of pick up um, that thread and take it through the next kind of 10 or 15 years um, and sort of describe some of the process of um, the, the kind of real roots of this, you know, the opportunity to prevent it that, that wasn't taken. Um, and so I think, yeah, we've done quite a few post Grenfell, but I think that's the one that's sort of felt the most unusual and the most kind of worthy of the title investigative. Um, so, yeah, that's us. Fantastic. I mean, I have to say, as a, as a uh, B2B editor, the stuff that you guys were doing on Grenfell was just absolutely awe-inspiring. I think it was fantastic. Um, uh, I mean, all around it. I remember, uh, again, this my, my recollection might not be correct, but um, you almost had, I think you had something pretty much ready on cladding, an investigation on cladding ready, while, just a couple of days before Grenfell, if I remember rightly. Uh, Timeline slightly squished. We did, we did, we'd looked into a previous fire before Grenfell, um, which then as a result, it wasn't quite a cladding fire that, but as a result of some of the conversations we had, um, people said to us, um, oh, there's, there's a real issue in this country with cladding. And so we'd, we'd written that story. Uh, I think it was uh, two, two months before Grenfell. It wasn't immediately before. Um, but I had, I did actually having, having written that about one tower block fire, I was actually planning that summer in 2017 to kind of expand that and have a look at whether this was an issue for other blocks and all that kind of thing. And then obviously, you know, events overtook that, but yeah. Incredible, incredible stuff. Um, so uh, Rachel, I said, I'll come back to you because I thought some of the stuff that you would come out with was really fascinating. Um, and uh, you mentioned this at the very start of your talk actually, but I think it's probably worth exploring a little bit more. What exactly is investigative journalism? What makes it different? Why, what makes it different to a news story that you produce in a day or two? What, what separates investigative journalism from, from you know, a bog standard, exclusive off diary news story? Well, I'm not sure that there's necessarily much. I mean, I'm not sure the label investigative journalism is, is particularly helpful because you know, there's so, it's basically journalism that asks questions, um, that provides, gets information into the public domain that people or organisations or governments don't want in the public domain. Um, and it's, you know, some, some investigations can take a day. It may just be a matter of putting in the right FOI, although I would say don't use FOI, it no longer works. Our whole FOI system is completely broken. But, um, you know, it might be as easy as finding a report in a select committee that has been you know, buried, nobody's looked at, because you've got the background, you've got the knowledge, you can ask the right questions, um, and you reveal something that nobody else reveals or knows and that is important that makes a difference that causes things to change um, and for me that sort of sense of change that sense of impact I think is a, a very important part of investigative journalists and we're not the change makers I mean which potentially is um, but as journalists most of us don't consider ourselves change makers but we provide the material we provide the documents we provide the evidence and that's absolutely crucial in investigative journalism that we get our facts right that we've spend enough time to properly stand things up and to properly back things up um, and that we properly ask the right questions. Um, and we provide the material which then allows change to happen. And that's, you know, it doesn't always happen, but ultimately we are trying to reveal some bad in the world or something wrong. Some, and, you know, the systemic, for me, the more, the more systemic that, that bad the more systemic that wrong the better the story absolutely and just to follow on that for that i completely agree you know for me uh actually a one day story is much better to, it takes less resources and if we can find out the information in a day then brilliant um i always say you know you i know i completely agree with your um uh, assessment of foi but you know when we were using foi if there's a government if there's already government stats out there that's buried somewhere then we want to use that we don't want to be spending 30 days waiting for an FOI to come back and having to then um uh, and then you know follow up on the CCGs or, or whatever to try and get those um so I, I completely I completely agree with you on that um just uh sort of touching on some of the stuff that you've come out something I think separates you from um Harry and Peter is Harry and Peter have got obviously more 
uh, sort of a, a more niche, probably maybe not so much Harry, but more niche thing. Um, with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, it's just investigative journalism. So what sort of gives you the spark? What made your reporter have a look at supply chains of meat to supermarkets, for example? Is it a tip or is it just a feeling or what, what, what sparks that off? Yeah, so that's a very good question. It was a question that, so the Bureau was set up in 2010 and it was a question that we asked ourselves so many times, what should we be investigating? And it's really one of the one of the hard things is you've got a team of investigative reporters around you. You've got a team of editors. You've got resource. You've got money to spend on freelancers. And it's like, OK, where are the stories? You know, the stories don't grow on trees and stories come from journalists asking questions. And sometimes, yeah, you get a massive big tranche of data or you get a leak. It's usually because you've been asking the right questions, um, but sometimes you get things just arrive completely unexpectedly. But that is the exception. You know, that's once in a lifetime type of story. Most of the stories come from reporters who are curious about something, interested in something, and therefore ask the right questions. So I would actually say that, and this is something we thought a lot about at the Bureau, that actually trade publications or publications that have a theme or have a niche, they are the best places to be doing the investigations because you know your subjects, you know the questions to ask, you can properly scrutinize, you know when someone's lying to you, you know where to find the information, you know what's important. There's always should be a so what to investigative journalism. You know, so what, why is this important? What's the news line? Um, so, and as a result at the Bureau, we now actually have areas of of investigation so we have a finance team we have a health team we have an environment team um, we have a big tech team and we have a local team Um, and that's because it's so much stories tend to come from beats they tend to come from people with an interest with some background with some knowledge asking the right questions Absolutely. And just to add to that, something that uh, one of my sparks investigation is just find out where there's a lack of information. Do we know, for example, one of the ones that we did, we started doing in 2013, we've done every year since, is number of GP practices that closed. There was no information out there about that. So mm-hmm. therefore, we want to find out. It'd be brilliant if there's an easy way of doing that. If there's a document out there, brilliant, we'd do that. But it was a, an FOI in that case. But um, it's an absence of information. I think when people have got patches, they know where they know what they don't know. They know, they know the questions. So one of the big one, big successes that we that we did that again won loads of awards was basically we recorded how many homeless people died in a year. It's a stat that as this country we should have. And nobody, we wanted to do a completely different investigation, but we couldn't do that investigation because the stats didn't exist. And the um uh, the National Office of Statistics didn't have it either. So as a result of our work, actually, now they've started counting them. Um, and that was a massive piece of work, you know, working with GP surgeries, working with a e departments, working with police departments, just asking lots of working with local reporters all over the country just to gather up a sense of how many people, homeless people die a year and what gender, what age, what circumstances, what they die from to get a pattern of, of you know, a massive big social problem in our lives so as you say it's sort of that gap of information and you as experts will know what everyone doesn't know you know what the question is to ask you know where the information um, doesn't exist well that's incredible i can't believe that i didn't 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 cut those statistics beforehand incredible um harry so let's uh, turn to you so what would um what what is the inspiration for for your investigation when you when you're um briefing reporter what is it what where do the ideas come from the ideas come from the writers, um, you know, as it should be. Uh, I think, you know, as a, similar to um, the bureau, you know, we 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 have people in, um, you know, we have a, a, an investigative team, but it's, it's broken down by by subject expertise. Um, obviously, as a, as a magazine, as an organisation, we we identify subjects that we think are kind of strategically important to us. Um, you know, and those will be things like, um, I mean, you know, uh, we call it digital life, but you know, it, it effectively everything from scams to online security to, um, you know, everything, everything as a consumer that you face in the digital world that um, there's potential source of harm or benefit. Um, that's a big one for us. Um, sustainability has been a big um, priority for us as a as a, a publisher and an organisation. Um, scams has been has been huge so we we have those areas where we know we're strong where we know we have expertise we have 
campaigning um, points that we want to make um, in order to, to change things and make things better. Um, but as a as a magazine, you know, for me, it's it's about writers coming to me with a pitch. Some of it is with all of you. Um, I guess I guess one difference with us is, you know, because we we really want to um, to build a body of evidence that, that we can then use beyond beyond a magazine article, you know, potentially in a, in a campaign, or, or we want to generate, um, you know, lots of PR coverage for something uh, to really amplify our, our message. Um, it becomes a process of deciding, okay, where do we devote time? Where do we devote resource? Um, you know, where do we... Um, where do we really push to do something original and different and, and substantial? Um, and ultimately that will come down to your priorities, but also where do you actually need to do that? Um, because, you know, if you can, if you can find something out by, uh, by talking to people and, uh, and having good sources and, and simply reporting what you find out, then great. You always do that first if you can. Um, and that, I, I guess that comes back to the definition of what makes something investigative. It, it, usually it's, it's the sort of things that, you can't obtain by asking the people who would know because they don't want you to know or because they have a vested interest in you not reporting it. Um, you know, it's inconvenient for them in some way. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we want to do original investigative research in, in areas that are important to us and, and our readers and, and um, supporters. Um, so that's, that's the crux of it. Fascinating. Peter, let's move on um, to, to you. So obviously, I think with uh, more niche areas like mine and yours, um, investigations tend to be sort of um, show themselves more than, than necessary us sort of thinking that they need to be done. So if that makes sense, you know, it's normally more apparent what they are. So from your point of view, what, what makes you think, um, uh, especially your news editor background before as well, what makes you think this isn't a story we should just do with what we've got? We should be spending more time investigate and find out a bit more information before we actually publish this what what what's what's the spark for you yeah it's an interesting question um i think i think there's a couple of things really i mean i think one of them is um i think rachel mentioned when she was talking about the homelessness death sometimes you come across a gap in the statistics which you think you can fill um and i think that that can be a really powerful space for investigation um and sometimes quite simple as well. Uh, one of the my most quoted investigation is one where we found out that forty percent of right to buy council homes um, are now being rented privately. I see that kind of cropping up everywhere, and that that really did just come from what what the process Rachel described. We were trying to find the number out and couldn't, and realised that nobody calculated it, and then found a way of doing so. Um, I think I think there's a, one would be you know the the, the the obvious answer for a B two B editor and news editor is relevant to, to the kind of core readership and the importance for, for them, for, you know, I guess GPs for you guys and um, uh, for us, the, the, the housing professionals out there, is this an issue that's really going to matter to them that they're going to want to spend, uh, you know, 3000 or so words with when we finally publish, is it going to make a difference to them no, having this information? I think also you do get a feel over time for, for the, the scope a news story has, you know, if you, you hear a news reporter coming into your news meeting and telling you something and it's clear that the context they're speaking to and, and the, the um, availability of information and the kind of size of the scandal is a bit bigger than just the news line that they've got that week, the kind of maybe we should be pulling pulling a few strings here and following these threads starts to kind of go off a little. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different world from, from Rachel's in that we have that kind of drumbeat of news and, and reporters out there kind of getting, trying to find stories all the time. And that it's those stories deliver the, the ideas for investigation. So we don't kind of have to start from um, scratch, if you like. But I think you, you just kind of want that kind of happy medium of uh, this is something which is going to, to to matter to our readers. And also you just have that kind of sixth sense after a little while that there's more here. And not only is there more here, but there's something that we can access. Either there's a source that will talk to us. There is somebody who's going to provide leaked documents. There is an easy way through this via FOI. Or there is, there is just you kind of the talk about kind of 
that that parable of people touching different parts of an elephant and then trying to work out what it is they're seeing. And you kind of just get that feeling that you're sort of touching the trunk of an elephant, but you can sense that there's a bigger one behind it. Um, if people don't know that metaphor, then that probably made absolutely zero sense. But um, yeah, sorry, it's a slightly abstract answer I've given, but hopefully, um, hopefully it comes comes through. No, I think that makes sense and certainly resonates with me. But how how would you um, have you ever um, sort of held back a story, thinking that we don't want to give away, we don't want to give away our info here. We're holding this story back. We think that it's we're confident that no one else is going to get it. We yeah. think that this needs to be. Yeah, I have. And, and I've sometimes had my fingers burnt as well in the, you, you know, you, you, you expect that and, and, and suddenly someone has, has popped up with the, the same or very similar story in that space. Um, I think I think what I will tend to do is one thing I've actually found throughout my career, at, particularly at Trade Magazine, is that sometimes the best way of opening up an, an investigation is to write about it. So um, once you've got one news line out into the public domain, you put a flag up over yourself as here is the person who is interested in this issue and is talking about it. And I, I think all of all of my big and best investigations have come from that one news story that maybe had a bit of bit of something in it, hadn't quite got there, but someone then phoned me on the back of that and said, oh, I see you wrote about X. Did you know that it actually goes a bit deeper than this? And then you take it from there. So I think if, if, if people, if there's a very firm news line, that that can be published I think I would err towards publishing it and using that as a kind of staging post towards a bigger investigation I think where I'm, I'm less likely to do that is where I feel like the reporter doesn't know if they they, they, they just don't have the, the 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 full story yet and we kind of risk mistelling it. it those are the points when I'm more likely to say okay well, what can we get through FOI what can we get through the context that we've got what new context can we make you might talk to us before we put this into the public domain um yeah, I'm sure you've had similar conversations at Pulse many times. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I have to say, I've even put out editorials that haven't been great, but I've been a fishing exercise to see if anyone's yeah, exactly, yeah. going to call me yeah. back. So, yeah, so I know exactly what you mean there. Um, so, uh, Rachel, let's go back to basics. So, um, you've been given a tip. You know there's something there. Uh, at least I know this is a massive question, so apologies. But where do we go? Where, where, what is the, what's the first stage? You've been given a tip. Let's say, let's talk about supply, uh, supply chain to British supermarkets. Where do you first start? Um, well, I think again, okay, it is back to basics. I think one of the the key things is to, as Harry mentioned it earlier, is to start with your hypothesis. What do you think is the problem here? Which is sometimes a question, or it's sometimes a statement of fact, or it's sometimes a tip that you've been given, but. You know, what are you trying to prove? What are you trying to find? And then the second thing I always say is try and work out what is going to be the asset. And that is also a way of making sure that if you are scooped on a story, um, if you've been going after an asset, then you don't lose everything. Because if there's something that you can bring to the table, so, you know, if there's data, if there's a source, if there's some evidence, if there's um some created evidence, so you set up a false website and you, you get a lot of evidence as a result of that. If there's some sort of asset that you can bring that will help to document the problem and provide the crucial piece of evidence for the problem, then that gives you something to go after. So that might be put in an FOI, go and read a select committee report, go and find the right person. I mean, that's another thing that investigative journalists tend to do, particularly on big projects, is map out all the people who might know the answer to your hypothesis. You know, literally sit down and go, okay, so this company, this government department, find out all the people who work at a certain level, go and look at LinkedIn, go and look on Twitter, go and look at social media, get all their contacts and work out who you need to talk to and then work out the order you need to talk to them at because that's really important too. Um, and... And then as part of that map, you can also map out all the bits of information that you're going to need, to need to prove your hypothesis. And that might be a big data dump. It might be getting that data. It might be a piece of evidence. But again, that allows you to start working out what do I need to do next? Um, so something you mentioned earlier about um, uh, uh, your reporter phoning up 60 different people. I thought, you know, whenever I see a young reporter phoning up people, it just makes my heart. It's, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. So, but following on from that, you mentioned uh, looking at um, LinkedIn, etc. What kind of trust do you need? What kind of trust do you need to establish with a, with a source before you? think that uh, before they'll start giving up in um, classified confidential information. Yeah, so it depends on the source and it depends on the story. Um, 
you know, some sources that we have worked with have literally taken over a year to actually build the trust to get, as Peter mentioned, you know, they're spending a day, a week in someone's garden looking through documents because they just don't want to let the documents know. That is good. That is quite common. And there's, you know, there's a good reason why they shouldn't let those documents go because often the documents have digital fingerprints on them or or they will show a certain type of printer. So, you know, it's not necessarily always a good idea to hand over documents or email you files. Um, so sometimes, you know, it can take, literally months to build up the level of trust with a source and sometimes that does take as you said you're going to have to publish a few stories just from a goodwill point of view so they know you're on it and um, sometimes I mean one of the best stories that we did in terms of just a mad story um was one of those stories where again we'd mapped out all the people that we needed to talk to and you know it was literally almost like going through the telephone directory okay call the person call the person ask 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 and we finally we were trying to find out about this massive big 600 million US dollar contract that Bell Pottinger had with the US government, well, with the CIA um, in Iraq. And we just literally called up every single person who had worked there until eventually we got someone and they said, oh, I've been waiting for a journalist to call me. My NDA has just run out. It's a really interesting story. Do you want me to tell you? And, you know, that was it. We got this amazing story. Um, there was, we didn't have to build up much trust. I mean, over the weeks that they told us their story, we built up trust. Um, but it was just the right person at the right time. So, you know, and that, it, it, again, if you're doing a story of very vulnerable people, so we've done a lot of, a lot of stories about um domestic violence within the police service and you're dealing with incredibly vulnerable people who've been through the most horrific um things and you know they've not been dealt with very well by the police or by the by the regulators um so they are incredibly vulnerable so that's not just about trust you're almost you're having to not become their therapist you're having to try and create this professional basis on which you're you know understanding on which you can have these conversation so you know a lot of that does come with experience and doing it um I would say or you know whatever it's always good to spend time with your sources apart from anything else it's always really important to find out what their skeleton is why do they want to tell you this information there may be a very good reason there may be a very bad reason and that bad reason you need to know that bad reason as much as the good reason and you're only going to get that if you build up time so if you can actually put time into working with with sources it really does pay off not just from a story point of view but from an accuracy depth point of view too absolutely i found when i've done investigations as well i've been talking to a lot of people by the time you're talking to their 10th 20th person they're more likely to open up because you know that you understand the story. You know what the yeah. touch points are. Yeah. So that to me has always been a big thing. So the first couple, really hard to extract any information because you're not coming armed with anything yourself. By the 20th person, you know, you know a lot of this stuff already. I'm just verifying it as well. And that is resilience, right? Because you'll get so many calls where people are not prepared to talk. And there's a, there's a question in the chat actually about picking up the phone. I would say it's so much easier to write an email, so much easier to write an email, but it's also much easier to answer an email, right? And you get no trust across email, electronic communications. You get no nuance. You, If you want an actual conversation, you, you know instinctively if somebody's holding something back. You don't get that on email. So pick up the phone. And guess what? If you pick up the phone and somebody is there on the other end. They also feel obliged to talk to you. It's really difficult to put the phone down. It's really very difficult. It's very, very easy, sorry, to ignore an email. So it is, it's a skill that, yeah, we talk a lot, um, or I, I talked a lot um, to our young reporters about. It's just, you have to do it. You just have to build that resilience and that robustness of picking up the phone and learning how to talk to people. Absolutely. I remember when I was a young reporter as well, I'm watching an older, an older reporter on the phone and you could tell how good he was because he kept saying, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. So that's not so much investigative journey, but I think that's for me. And I, I, think that's, I, I, yeah, I think that's absolutely key. It's, you know, don't take it as read. It's perfectly acceptable to say, just explain that to me. Explain that to me again. Take me through it. Draw me a map. Just tell me again. And actually, again, that's a really good way of fact checking and checking the resilience of your and the robustness of your source. Because if they can tell you the same thing three times, then you know it's accurate. If they tell you it three times and there's a few little changes, 
then people have, you know, people don't remember things always correctly. And it takes a few tellings to actually get to the bottom of things before you actually find the real facts of the matter. It's just because they tell you what they want to tell you. They don't tell you the full full picture or they don't remember everything. Harry, um, can we slightly sli move on? Um, so um, hearing about your investigation, again, fascinating, start up a new company and uh, which travel one of booking hotels concurrently so that uh, you can see if it's been cleaned or not. Um, these are quite resource intensive. Does in Is net investigative journalism necessarily resource intensive? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely not. Um, it's about picking your battles, I suppose, in terms of what you want to devote time and energy to and, and also how much time and energy you actually need to devote to something. I mean, it, you know, um, I work with brilliant investigative journalists who, you know, if you if you put them in a, in a meeting room for a few hours with a stack of insurance company terms and conditions or something, you know, they'll, they'll probably find you a pretty good story. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the, the unsexy side of investigative journalism um, I think it's, it's something we should we should talk about here because I think I think when a lot of people think about investigative journalism, they think about the sexy stuff. They're they, they're thinking about sort of meeting sources in um, you know in, in dimly lit car parks and, and you know they, most of it's not like that at all. Um, most of it's much more like sifting through incredibly tedious documents um, or or looking through companies' house records. Um, you know, whatever it might be. And so having, you know, having the people who know what they're looking for or the people who know what questions to ask and how to interrogate, often, you know, freely available information, you, you, know, you often don't need to do an FOI or, um, uh, you know, or obtain something that's, that's not in the public domain. You know, there's plenty in the public domain. You know, a lot of data journalism is just interrogating stuff that is out there in a way that hasn't, been interrogated before so if you've got the right staff you can do loads of stuff without devoting enormous amounts of budget um and and you know time you know yeah it depends um i guess money money is often the um the more pressing barrier um depending on on, on the way you work but um yeah it's always it's always um it's always great to do something that um you know, it comes from the, the, the least likely or the least glamorous beginnings, um, you know, and sometimes that's that's the way it goes. Yeah, I mean, I remember watching the film Spotlight um, and there was a five minute segment of them just looking through databases, which I thought was fantastic. So, yeah, that's what investigative journalism is like, if anyone's interested. Um, Peter, again, moving on, uh, moving on again. So something you've touched on already is uh, sources and protection of sources. Now, I've personally found that some of the hardest thing about investigations are protecting your sources and uh, sort of disguising it to make sure that no one knows who your sources are. Um, is this a problem that you come across? Is this something that uh, um, any tips that you've got for for journalists on that? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I think it's enormously important. Um, part of all journalism not just investigative journalism but news journalism is is is, is you know nothing will destroy your reputation as a journalist faster than 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 um either inadvertently or, or deliberately betraying a source and so it's something that that you know all self-respecting journalists value extremely highly i think there's there's certain areas where you need to be particularly careful when you're, you're doing in investigations i think um for example if you're talking about you know if, you, if you're trying to anonymize someone, you've got to really anonymize them. You know, you you you, you might want to. Someone might be content for you to say um, that they worked at a certain organization doing something, but not put their name out. But I think you, as the journalist, need to kind of push back on that and say to them, "Well, actually, if I say that you did that, you know, I'm gonna. Is it possible that your former employers could work out that um, you were?" this person based on the data that we were agreeing we're going to put in and you have to work through that with them because they might not have thought about the consequences necessarily and I think you've got an obligation as a journalist to do that there's there is very little protection unfortunately for whistleblowers um I think also another thing to be aware of is when you're going to organizations for right of reply be very careful about what you forward on um, I think Rachel mentioned in, in the comments a minute ago about how documents can sometimes have identifying information on. Um, that's actually not that difficult to uh, 
to to download so you know if you say uh, you, you want to go to an organization and say we've been forwarded this email um don't <laughs> don't just you know black out the person's name I, I mean what i do in that situation is i create an entirely fresh document i just write it from fresh i just literally open up a new word document have it printed out in front of me and write it again if i if i have to send it to them i, I never send an original file um yeah so i think i'm um, uh, but i think basically what you need to do with the source is um you need to kind of be reassuring them and you need to be bringing them along with you and you need to be speaking to them regularly and letting them know what's going to happen and what you are going to publish and what you aren't and being very clear with them about a lot of the time when you talk to these people, um, you know, and you talked about this when you were talking about interviewing a moment ago, people have so much to share. They have so much they want to kind of get off their chest almost. You're suddenly kind of realising that people are almost kind of unburdening themselves with these great secrets to you um, and they'll flip so fast between what's off the record and on the record people are suddenly go oh, this is off the record this is off the record and you can't keep up with that so you have to just be very careful you're going going back to them and saying look this is the bit that i wanted to take from you is that okay and and and, and all of that sort of thing just making sure that you have that kind of two-way communication because i think as soon as you start assuming and not really thinking through those consequences you, you can you can make mistakes absolutely can i just add on right reply that's something that's one of my biggest bugbears um, right reply I've got to be given so you know, you've got to be given in advance of publication um, the amount of times that we've come close to press day and uh, we haven't gone to every single party that needs to have right reply is really really frustrating so yeah. that's just a little bugbear of mine anyway um, we've got some great questions um, uh, I'll start off with Tim Tim Pollard um, who's chair of BSME um, can the panel suggest how to add professional search polish to editorial investigations uh, I'm always struck by how much rigor professional researchers bring to the game, and journalists don't necessarily have the train to deliver it. Training to deliver it. I think that's a great question. Um, Rachel, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I think that is a really great question. So, um, again, it was something, and we have the, the privilege and the luxury of being able to hire a fact checker at the bureau. So, every single thing at the bureau is fact checked, like diligently properly every single thing is marked up then the journalist has to provide the bit of information where they got it from um i i think the more fact checking you can do the better and it starts with the reporters and it starts by making a log we have host uh, we have sorry uh, master files so every single bit of information that you get in an investigation you put you upload into a master file which often shared with other people but it's also very carefully marked about where you got it from um, and if you got it from the internet, you take a screenshot because that internet page is going to disappear during your investigation process, or certainly will at the point of right to reply. So no point in saying to your editor, well, it was there two days ago, because that's not good enough. That would definitely get scrapped in, in, our, um, in our work. So I, I think the more you can build in time to do proper fact checking and also as you say, Jamie, to do the right to reply process. Because I think the right to reply process is a supremely important part of investigative journalism. It's not a got you moment. It's a, this is what we've found out. We want you to respond because actually we want to know what we have got wrong if we've got something wrong. Please tell us. So there should be no tricks. It should be totally upfront. What do you need them to respond to? And you know, you need to think about your timing on that because obviously there are things like injunctions or uh, some organisations will leak the story or um, they will change the story or they'll take the website down, blah, blah, blah. So you need to think through your timings. But actually, to properly copper bottom your, your stories, you need to give all the people involved, all the organisations, all the government ministers and departments, et cetera, involved in your stories, proper time to reply. So I would say Absolutely. that's one of the ways to, to, to bring research close. But, um, there is a massive difference between academia and journalism. And I think, you know, speed is one of them. One of the things in journalism is you do want to get these stories out and you want to get them out in a timely nature. So sometimes academic research polish does go by, go to the wayside because you're focusing on one thing rather than the, the, the um, everything. But I think fact checking and right to reply help. Absolutely. Can I just add on right to reply? Sorry, again, like I say, it's my bugbear, but um, just uh, add, uh, to uh, add on right to reply. For me, it's one of the biggest parts of the investigation when you get that back, and it's what's not said in the right to reply as well. So when they don't challenge what you've written, then you know that you're on, you know that you're right there, you know that you're fine to publish that. They haven't challenged what you've said. 
We've given them full details about what we're writing. Haven't said anything. We're fine to go with it. That to me is one of the biggest part of um, investigation. Um, we have got a couple more questions. So I'd like to just uh, crack on. This one's probably one for Peter, actually. Um, so uh, how do you convince publishers and or advertisers to let you go ahead with more difficult, sensitive or change investigations? As a previous trademark, uh, previous trademark I worked at, this was the biggest barrier. Um, well, I'm, I'm lucky at Inside Housing in the, um, the, the advertisers' issue has never been an issue for me. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's in the ethos of the, the publishing company I work for. Um, I've lost the company business um, directly by, and they, they've said, they phoned up the, the sales team and they were running this because of the story piece. And, and, you know, that hasn't made me particularly popular with the commercial team, but the company understand that they have to, we have to have editorial freedom. Otherwise we, we don't have integrity as a publication. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, because you know it's not the case everywhere, and um, it would be very very difficult to 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 deal with if it wasn't. I think um, I think the slightly more difficult one is 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 publishers. I mean, it, maybe not so much in in, in my experience from um, saying you can or can't go after certain stories, but that I think that what they the they want a kind of tone of the magazine, which is on the side of the, the subscribers and the audience and the, 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 the sector that you work in. You don't want to, you know, we write for housing associations and, and, and local authorities. And I think the line we do have to walk is people wouldn't want us to, we wouldn't want to be seen as a, as a publication that's anti those bodies. And so I think that means you have to be measured in your criticism. You have to be authoritative and you have to make sure that, you know, when you do decide to kind of flag some bad, bad practice and, and, and criticise it, it, it really is bad practice and you really know what you're doing and where you're coming from. I think that if, if you do all that, you, you, you're going to, you know, you will make some enemies along the way. But I think the majority of people in the sector will appreciate what you're doing is good for their industry and it's good to hear about those kind of things. Um, but, you know, there, there, there are trade mags and trade mags and there, there are certainly some out there that, that won't tolerate um, stories which wind the, 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 the subscribers and the advertisers up and I think that's a real shame. I have to say, um, this is something coming from B2B background as well. Someone noticed that it it does help if you're someone like Inside House or Pulse, an established brand that's been around for ages that doesn't need to do that. It is harder for smaller brands. There is no two ways about it. Uh, although I do remember, one, I, if you just indulge me in one quick story, because I really like this one. I had once uh, a reporter come to me with a, uh, an idea for investigation. Elizabeth, I don't know if she's on the, the line now, but it was a um, fantastic investigation. It was looking at awareness campaigns and about how basically any awareness campaign, you know, uh, you know, m m m well, not November, but those kind of things, um, have, you know, tens of pharmaceutical um, back in is that it was uh the pharmaceutical companies were our biggest advertisers so i remember having a horrible conversation with my ceo and i felt for him as well actually at the time saying you know what we're going to do here you know what we're going to do here and talking to me for it uh, about it journalistically we actually went with it in the end uh, it won an award i remember uh, john my ceo coming in afterwards saying this is a great investigation we should be doing more stuff like this I'm like yeah okay <laughs> you can you can say that now but um but it is it is certainly tough especially for the smaller magazines it is tough and i do have quite a bit of sympathy for for editors of smaller magazines um we have got uh, we have got another question here um and i think it's been touched on again um, there's been uh, lots of examples of brilliant investigative journalism pieces on earth and many hidden matters. Um, there are, however, some other pieces that have a lot of individual bias and have a preconceived agenda that or the author has in a, a vendetta, which leads to an unfair report. How can one avoid negative individual biases impacting the piece? Um, Rachel, come to you on that one. I think that's a very good question. Um, I also, I mean, this goes back to some of the things we were talking about sources. Sources will always have individual biases too. So as a reporter, you can often take on your sources' biases or, you know, something that they hated or have a particular vendetta about. Um, I think one of the, the key ways to avoid it is to find yourself a bloody good editor, actually, because editors really do help to, or a good editor um, should help to pull a reporter out of a rabbit hole or out of a bias and ask the right questions and the difficult questions. And um, that's what editors are there for. So, you know, um, when, when an editor is asking you a difficult question, it could be because they're just trying to flesh out the, you know, your, your bias or the, the, the route that you've gone. Um, 
And I, th- I do think actually trying to tell the, the story to your mother or to your brother or to your partner or your children, again, that really does help to flush out those biases too. Because if you can tell it in a neutral, engaging fashion, um, or if you're sort of been a little bit, you're justifying it or you're being a bit defensive about it, it means you've got a bias. Um, I mean, a good reporter will always try to avoid the biases, but we are human and it is very difficult. So, you know, properly stress testing with other reporters or friends and families or um, better still an editor, that's one of the ways you can do it. That's it, absolutely agree. I mean, for me, a big piece, a long piece like that needs to go through more than just a report and editor. We need to have people in between as well. Um, for me, it, it can sort of never have enough scrutiny um, on your team. Um, so I completely agree on that. Um, we are coming towards the end of our time. Um, so let's just have a little bit of a summing up then. So um, I know there are quite a few students online. So let's start with, uh, let's ask, I'm going to ask each of the panellists what tip you would give for an inspiring investigative journalism uh, student, let's say a student, Want to get into the? Uh, want to get into it? What is the first thing they should be looking at? What skill should they develop? Just any, for uh, any tip, take that question as you like. Um, uh, Peter, let's start with you. I think I would say if you're a student and you're starting out, become a news journalist first, because I think developing the ability to have a new sense and and pick through and, and develop exclusives and, and build up contacts and and do write of replies and, and and many of the skills that we've kind of touched on over the last hour or so are inherent in news journalism and I think that you're unlikely to come out of college and get an investigative journalism job straight away um, but if you get a news reporting patch especially at a, a title which will allow you to kind of look for some exclusive off diary things and maybe work up some sort of smaller scale investigations that is the way to kind of start moving along that line and learning the skills that you need so um, I would I, I think become a become a news hound first I think is 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 the way I would go about it I completely agree Harry yeah well, I absolutely agree with what Peter just said um, and previous points we've made you know um, sources being on the phone being comfortable with that or, or even putting yourself through being uncomfortable with it um, to the point where it becomes more normal um, I say also just be open-minded to where you might end up or what you might become expert in you know um I, I hope I, I hope I you know don't offend anyone if I say that I'm sure you know people at university might not you know the first thing on their list might not be oh, I could you know I could write for a magazine that's for housing professionals right but you you can work on Peter's magazine and and do award-winning journalism that sets the agenda um that has real expertise behind it you know you've you've, I know done work in collaboration with the Sunday Times Peter you know in recent years it's you know often you know someone a long long long-term admirer of of trade magazines um so you know I've I've actually not worked on any although I've was close to a lot of it when I when I started covering investments you know find that niche become become an expert in your niche um Find the right people who can help you find those stories, and then just have have ideas. You know, have a, a, a list of half a dozen ideas at any at any particular time, at various levels of being worked up, that you are either ready to pitch or that you're ready to to, to be um, you know scheduled to to be published to start work on. You know, never never be short of an idea. Um, and uh, and you'll always be valuable to editors if you're if you're a person who knows their stuff and and is always good for an idea when an idea is needed you'll be you'll be highly highly valued. Rachel, um, I think that I think that tip to become an expert no become a, an expert in an area because you know how to ask the right questions and be curious and ask questions. I've also I'm just going to put up a couple of really great places of resources. Um, Global Investigative Journalism Network, their website is full of amazing tips, ideas, um, inside investigations, and the UK one, Centre for Investigative Journalism, again, they run a summer school, it's not super expensive, loads of stuff on their website too, so I've just dropped those two in, they're they're really good places to go and get some help tips and skills as well. Fantastic, thank you Rachel, can I just echo that as well, just want to say for me, 
be curious, um, ask questions, be curious, be interesting people. Um, for me, it's it's sort of an extension news reporting. You know, if a story gets done in a day or it gets done in four, six months, you know, it can be equally valid. Um, just be curious, ask questions and be interesting people. That would be my tips. Um, anyway, we are at the end now. So I just want to say thank you so much. I found it absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much to the panel. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Peter. That was what, uh, really interesting, I thought. I've um, just got a couple of bits of uh, uh, housekeeping. Um, obviously, this is a BSME event. Um, we have got um, the awards coming up next, uh, coming up soon. Um, the BSME Awards. 2022 will be opening for entries next month so please do keep an eye out especially you know there you can submit your investigative pieces and certainly be uh, judged well by the by our judges um we have got a few more there in the in the chat um in chat panel. we've got a uh, another seminar a face-to-face -face, um seminar on how to have an influencer strategy as a brand that's taking place uh, at shoreditch house in september 2022 uh, we have our summer party which will be the same month as well and uh following month we'll have something on how to launch an independent magazine so do keep an eye on the bsme website there's plenty throughout the year um and just want to say once again thank you to our panelists for what was really interesting chat and thank you for everyone who's been watching i hope you've learned something okay until next time thank you goodbye everyone